One of the problems with the English language is that there are different definitions for the same word. And when people use words like the collective or collectivism or the individual and individualism, sometimes they have different uh, meanings in their own minds. And so they get into discussions and arguments because they're not speaking the same language. They're not using the same definitions of the words. So in any discussion of collectivism versus individualism, I think it's necessary to do some definitions up front so that at least uh, people will know what I mean when I use those words. Now, they may not agree with my definitions, but at least they'll know what I mean when I use those words. Um, the, the definition of the word collectivism has very little to do with the fact that people are working collectively. You can work collectively in a voluntary fashion, or you can work collectively under coercion. And there lies the difference between collectivism and individualism. Individuals work collectively. They work together. They don't move their pianos alone. They call upon their friends, and they recruit their friends to help them, and they ask for help, and they participate in helping others in doing essential tasks. But they do it under conditions of voluntary cooperation. Collectivism implies that if something is important enough, then the state should step in and make sure that everybody conforms, whether they want to or not. They're not to be given uh, will, freedom of choice, or free will. They're to be coerced into doing it. So the essence of collectivism in a political sense, and the sense in which I use the word, is that it employs the use of coercion to require people to work together. And once coercion enters, then all of the other positive attributes, such as charity, go out the window. When you force people to do things against their will, then you are actually participating in a, a, a negative social conduct, which is in many cases worse than the uh, social condition that you're trying to overcome by the collective action. So in essence, to sum it up, collectivism is the concept, which among other things, there are other definitions to it too, but in terms of collective action or working together, it's a concept in which people are not given free will. They're required to do this and that because uh, the majority has decided this is for the greater good of the greater number and so forth. Whereas individualism uh, works toward the same goals, but they do so in the environment of freedom. So it's the difference between freedom and coercion. There are groups, many of them I think, that are seeking to establish a new world order, uh, a world government based on the model of collectivism. They uh, may not all be part of the same organization, but there are many groups which have that as their goal because it furthers their social and political goals, their, their aims, what they, what they want to see the world look like. Um, you can imagine who these people would be. The ones who control others benefit from a uh, totalitarian system. In other words, uh, politicians like collectivism because collectivism puts uh, ever-increasing power into their hands. Uh, bankers like collectivism because it gives the banks the power to create money with state sanction and state support to create money out of nothing, and that gives control over human beings. Um, anybody who, uh, who benefits from controlling others has a natural affinity to this concept of collectivism. They want to be in the driver's seat. They want to be the masters. They want to be the social engineers. They want to be the gatekeepers. And so all of these people work together instinctively, even though they may have separate individual or professional goals. They do work together and support each other toward this ultimate aim of a new world order, is how they like to describe it, which is a totalitarian system based on the model of collectivism. A one-world government could be wise or very unwise depending on the type of government it is. I have uh, no problem with the concept of a world government if it's based on the concept of freedom, individual uh, rights, and uh, it allows plenty of uh, 
latitude for individual culture, individual freedom of choice and religion, and all of these things. A world government based on the concept of liberty would be a wonderful thing, but that's not what we're dealing with today. The world government that is being grown up around us, headquarters at the United Nations, is not that kind of a government. It is a government based on the concept of collectivism, totalitarianism. It is not materially different than the kind of a world government that Adolf Hitler would have established had he been able to do so. It's not materially different than the kind of world government that uh, Joseph Stalin would have established had he been able to do so. So when we talk about this issue of is world government good or bad, that's an incomplete question. We have to discuss also what kind of a world government. So, in summary, a world government could be a good thing if it was based on the principles of individualism. But based on the principles of collectivism, it's one of the worst things you could possibly imagine. It's not easy to define the word collectivism in a few sentences because there are so many aspects to it. But it is easy enough to recognize a few of the major aspects, and you'll recognize it. One of the major aspects of collectivism is that it's based on the principle that the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. You'll find that under all forms of collectivism, whether it be Nazism, Communism, Fascism, Socialism, or Neoconism, or whatever you want to do. All of these forms of collectivism have that fundamental uh, philosophy or ideology beneath it. Now, that sounds pretty good to many people. It sounded good to me when I was in school and learning about the greater good of the greater number. After all, uh, we've been taught that we live in a democracy and therefore the majority should rule and all of these things which sound very good if you don't probe too deeply. And so many people think that that's a good concept. But it's a terrible concept when you, when you follow it to its roots. Because, you see, there's no such thing as a group. A group doesn't really exist. It's, it's all in the mind. Uh, the, the word group is an abstraction. It, it symbolizes in our minds the concept of many individuals. But group does not exist by itself. You cannot touch a group. You can touch individuals only. It's similar to the concept of the word forest. You can look at a forest, you say, well, I'm looking at a forest, but you're not. You're looking at trees. They're only trees, and so the word forest is this abstraction for the concept of many trees. And the same thing is true in social structures. The word group is a very deceptive word. We think that the group somehow has rights. Well, since there is no such thing as a group, we're really dealing with the concept of, of many individuals having somehow more rights than, uh, than a smaller group of individuals. And so uh, that really, if you follow it all the way to its core, is a question of mathematics. Uh, Collectivism is, is based on the substance uh, that uh, three people um, really have the right to tell two people what to do regardless, because there's three against two. And once you boil it down to the issue of mathematics, it falls apart, because um, human rights are not based on mathematics. Uh, I know we don't have time for a lot of this, but something that just occurred to me this morning when I was thinking about this concept, uh, they say that the, uh, the greater good of the greater number is, is accomplished by giving the larger number the right to dictate to the smaller number. But when you think it through, it's just the opposite. Let's suppose that you had uh, uh, four different elements in society. You had a group called uh, red, a group called green, a group that's blue, and then a smaller group that are purple. The red, green, and blue represent different classes or groups of society, and the purple ones are the administrators, the government officials, the police, the courts, and all of the bureaucrats and the politicians that are going to regulate this great society. So you say, well, a group, uh, the first two groups, red and green, uh, decide to take all the property away from blue. And that's certainly for the greatest good of the greater number because red and green is a greater number than blue. So if that's your point, and finally, the greater good of society has been served in that uh, equation. But now the next time around, uh, green and blue decide to take away the property of red. 
They can say, well, in that instance also, the greater good of the greater number has been served. And then finally, to round it out, you get, uh, uh, what did they do, red and green, green and blue. Well, blue and red then get together and take away the property of green. And here again, uh, the greater good of the greater number has been served. But when you stand back and look at the whole process, uh, all of the groups have been plundered by the others. And you might say, well, it all evens out, doesn't it? No, it doesn't, because there's a fourth group, the purple. And every time there's a plundering action going on, the purple wind up with a pretty good share of the action just for their administrative services. And so when you follow it all the way through at the end of this process, all of society has been damaged by this greater good for the greater number concept, you see. The only greater good for the greater number really comes from the concept of individualism when you deny the majority to, to take away the rights or the property of the minority. If you hold up the individual as the supreme element in society instead of the group, under that philosophy, under that ideology, now you do actually have the greatest good for the greatest number. A UN peacekeeper, well that phrase is merely a public relations phrase for an army, isn't it? Um, UN peacekeepers are just the, the soldiers that are employed by the United Nations. And they do what soldiers always do, and they apply physical force to compel uh, citizens and nations to uh, obey the dictates of the political leaders of the, of the political unit that is fielding the military force. And so the peacekeepers, uh, so-called, are merely the, the world policemen or the soldiers that enforce the dictates of the United Nations. And so when they bomb a city or shoot a civilian, that's a peaceful bomb and it's a peaceful bullet because they're restoring peace. And you see, it's just a bunch of propaganda. It's just a twisting of words to make people feel good about it. But the truth of the matter is that all armies are nothing but the instruments of coercion. I believe it's pretty easy to, to see from the record that governments almost always withhold things from their citizens if whatever it is they're withholding would, uh, uh, would not uh, cast a favorable light on the politicians or the bureaucrats or the government. If it makes the government look bad, they're not going to let the truth out. And um, to use the word paranoia, I think, is a bit um, unfair because if it's justified, in other words, if the government does in fact withhold information, then thinking that it does so is not paranoid. It's just a factual observation of reality. The word paranoid implies it's an extreme or unjustified suspicion that someone's out to get you. But if it's not an unjustified suspicion, if you know it's a fact, then it's not paranoia anymore. It's just recognizing reality. There definitely is a plan to consolidate the United States, Mexico, and Canada. It's, it's more than a plan. It's a, it's a mechanism. It's a um, movement that is well underway. It's not something that's to be done in the future. It's to be completed in the future. But the beginning stages already are well underway. And um, is it a good idea or not depends on what's going to come out of that merger. I believe that governmental units, regardless of whether they're small or large, whether they're local or national or even international, supposing we're going to merge the three nations together. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on the type of government that will be created. If we had the type of constitutional republic that we were given by our forefathers, if that were in place today, notice the word if, because unfortunately it has been terribly eroded. But if it were in place today, and if that were the concept of the kind of a government that we were going to use in the merger of Canada and Mexico with the United States, I think it would have a lot to be said for it. I would probably be in favor of it. But that is not what's happening today. What is happening today is the merger of these three countries into a collectivist super-regional government. By collectivist, I mean it will be totalitarian in nature. There will be very little room for individual rights. It will all be dictated from the top, and it will be 
practically a model of what we're now seeing happen in uh, Europe uh, and the European Union. We see uh, increasingly with the passing of every month that the rights of Europeans and the privileges as, as citizens in their respective countries are being eroded to the point where now the European Union is becoming the dominant political governmental force. And as a matter of fact, the people who are making the primary decisions in that government are not even elected by the people. They're appointed. It's becoming a self-sustaining, self-perpetuating dictatorship is what it is. And the people in Europe are not very happy about it, the ones who are aware. A lot of people, of course, are not even aware of what's happening. And they'd see, you know, it's okay because they don't know that they no longer have rights. But what will happen in the United States, Mexico, and Canada will be a perfect parallel of what we now seeing, uh, what we now see uh, happening in, um, in Europe. And it will not be a good thing for us. The word conspiracy causes a lot of people heartburn, doesn't it? Because uh, people have been conditioned to laugh at the word conspiracy. Uh, anytime somebody thinks that there are secrets being withheld by the government or that the government is not being forthright and telling us what really happened in this event or the other, uh, we get a lot of uh, commenters, uh, editorialists, who tell us, oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist. And that is supposed to close off the debate because who wants to be a conspiracy theorist? It makes you sound like you're mentally feeble or something like that. Well, actually, it's the other way around as far as the mental uh, feebleness is concerned because people who laugh at conspiracies, I kind of feel sorry for them. Uh, they've never read a history book. Because anybody who knows anything about history realizes that from the very dawn of history, world events have been shaped to a very large extent, by conspiracies of one kind or another. And it's just been going on throughout the centuries, and there's no reason to believe it stopped all of a sudden with the arrival of the year 2000, or 2008, or 2020, or whatever. No, it's an ongoing thing. And if you go to the courthouse in your local town or your county, and you just sit there long enough, you're going to see plenty of trials uh, brought to the front that involve conspiracies of one kind or another, conspiracies in business, conspiracies in the family, conspiracies to deny somebody their right, conspiracy on the part of a corporation to violate a law, uh, conspiracies all over the place. And yet when you come to government where the rewards of conspiracy are the greatest of all, we're supposed to think that it's impossible that the, our government would have conspiracies in it and anybody would think so is some kind of a looney tune. When actually it's just the other way around. People who question conspiracies, I think, have got an awful lot to learn. Is there a conspiracy at work to take over the world? There is a movement at work to take over the world. There is a group of people who are trying to do it, and they're well along, as a matter of fact, in accomplishing this goal. Uh, the trouble with the word conspiracy is that it needs to be defined. Conspiracy needs three parts to make it a true conspiracy. First of all, it has to involve uh, more than one person, two or more people. Uh, the second component is that it, it uses coercion or deception to accomplish its goal. And the third ingredient is that its objective has to be either illegal or immoral. If you have those three things together, then by dictionary definition, you do have a conspiracy. So we look at the group today, and I'm talking primarily, let's put a name on it, the group of people who are centered around the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, it's a relatively small group, about 4,000 people in the United States. All of their people are in very powerful positions in government, in the media, in the educational system, and so forth. They are really the hidden rulers of America. And they all have a common agenda. And that agenda is the establishment of a new world order based on the model of collectivism. So there's more than two of them. There's more than one of them. It's the, so that part of the conspiracy is satisfied. Uh, do they use coercion or deceit to bring about their goal? And as a matter of fact, they do. And they even boast of it in some cases. They certainly use coercion. They like to use the police. They like to use the armies to, uh, to um, manipulate um, uh, political divisions and bring about uh, regime change, as they call it, and that sort of thing, and to control the population at home. They're certainly willing to do that. But are they uh, doing something which is immoral or illegal? There is the question. Uh, 
probably not illegal because just about everything they do is quite legal. And they see to it because their people are the ones generally who make the laws. And so they make sure that they pass laws to require us to do the things they want to do. And if we resist, then we are the ones that are doing something illegal, and we might be called the conspirators, you see. So what they're doing, for the most part, is quite legal. And is it immoral or un unethical? And now here is the final edge uh, where you have to make a decision. They don't think so. They think that the goal that they are seeking is the highest uh, morality of all. This new world order that they envision to them is the highest morality for society. It's the highest goal. And those who seek it are the ones to be praised. And those who oppose it are the immoral ones. And they are the evil ones. They are the ones that should be put away. And so in their minds, they are not conspirators because they're pursuing something which is of such a great high ideal. And to them, if you have to lie and cheat and even kill in order to bring about this high ideal, it's necessary for the greater good of the greater number. So it's a good thing. Sometimes you have to do that. And they say, and, and so they don't see even those events of sacrificing, uh, human life as being necessarily immoral when it is done in the name of achieving some higher ideal. So in their mind, no, it's not a conspiracy. But in the minds, I think, of most of us who are being brought to being brought under this plan, who are now being forced to live according to this plan against our will, I think for most of us, the word conspiracy is a very justified word. Whether or not the energy establishment is hiding technology or thwarting it in some way is, of course, a uh, great suspicion in the minds of most people, including mine. I believe that they probably are. I think uh, that they they probably would if they could. After all, it, if they if they didn't, it could cost them hundreds of billions of dollars in profits. And so, knowing how the corporate mind works, I would assume that if they could suppress technology successfully, they would. But to say that I know for certain that this is the case would not be true because I don't have the specifics in front of me. But following the logic of it, I think we can safely say that if those guys had a chance to do so, they sure would. The U.S. Constitution, of course, is a document. It's a um, set of rules. Uh, it's the place we go when we need answers to political questions. Um, it is the, the compass that should lead the nation along the path of freedom and liberty for the individual. But in essence, it's merely a concept, isn't it? The words and the pieces of paper that, on which the words are written mean nothing by themselves unless they're studied, unless they're interpreted, unless they're understood, unless they're revered in the hearts of the American people. Unfortunately, that last part of the equation has not fulfilled. The American people today, especially the younger ones have come along, have never read the Constitution. Um, and those who have read it have never given much thought as to why the provisions were there. They've never read the Federalist Papers. They've never read the debates, for example, that um, went on between the framers of the Constitution at the time they were drafting the document. They don't know the rationale behind it. And so, therefore, it's easy for them to look at it until they say, oh, well, that's just a product of a period of America which was undergoing a, a, a agrarian reform of some kind. And that was good in those days, but it doesn't apply today. So once the concept of a document which limits the power of government, which is really what it is, once that concept is lost in the minds and the hearts of the people, then I'm afraid it does become just a piece of paper in some words. So the Constitution is not something that you hold up in front of you and you say, you can't do this to me because of the Constitution, you see, it's here to protect me. The Constitution is something that you hold in your heart and your mind and you hopefully uh, find that 
most of your fellow citizens do the same thing so that it's a question of the social fabric and the social consciousness of the people that provide the safeguards that are written down in the Constitution. In summary, the Constitution is nothing but a reference. It's, a, it's like a little textbook where we go to find the answers, but we must understand the rationale behind it before those answers make much sense. So to me, the Constitution is a wonderful document. It needs to be studied. It needs to be reinstated into the hearts and minds of the American people. And certainly in today's world, it needs to be followed. The significance of we the people, as it was written into the founding documents of the United States, was that the power of the government was coming from the people being handed to the government, and that the people, we the people, were the supreme authority. They were the source of the sovereignty. They were the ones that were creating the government, and the government was to be subject to their will. That was quite a different experience in the course of history, because prior to that, all governments were the other way around, that the governments were formed by the kings and, and the conquerors, and then they said, oh, yeah, well, by the way, now that we've got ourselves in charge here and we've got everything under control, let's see about the people. Maybe we'll think about the people. What rights are we going to give the people? What benefits will we give the people to keep them from revolting or whatever? But it was always the top down until the United States Constitution was written, and all of a sudden it was from the bottom up. We the people were instituting that government. So that's the essence of it. Unfortunately, the system has changed. Every year, incrementally, so slowly and so, so in such small little steps that you could hardly see it. The, the fulcrum has gradually tipped back the other way, and now we have reverted back to the old world style of government where, where the government is in charge and we, the people, are being told what to do by the government. And that's a situation that is very sad in my mind, and it's more than sad, it's very dangerous, and we had better change it or else we're going to wind up in abject slavery. The question of whether or not governments rule by force in a legitimate fashion, have ha, that question has a lot of little tricky levers on it, you know. Um, the issue of rule, let's take that word for example. Uh, should a government rule? Should a government govern? Or should a government protect? Now, the view of individualism is that the purpose of government is to protect to protect the lives, liberty, and property of its citizens, nothing more. Government is not there to govern, but to protect. So in that concept, you can say that government can uh, protect using force, of course. You have to use force against criminals who are trying to take away your life, your liberty, or your property. No government can protect you if they don't have authority to use force to protect you. So in that sense, that would be legitimate. But now if we switch over that word rule and include a whole different uh, concept of should they tell you what to do with your life, should they tell you where to work, what time to get up, uh, what to say, what to think, where to travel, and so forth, uh, how you should engage in your economic transactions, where to live, all of these things. Now that's a different concept for governing. And in my view, uh, there's certainly nothing logical or legitimate about this. And the use of force to do that kind of thing, of course, that's just the same old, uh, same old concept of totalitarianism in which the, the king will tell you what to do with your life. So it depends on what you mean by the word govern. The Patriot Act violates numerous provisions of the Constitution, particularly the, uh, the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights. There are many provisions in the Patriot Act which go directly contrary to uh, our Bill of Rights. So, um, to me, on the surface of it, the Patriot Act is totally unconstitutional. There are some side issues there that, uh, that I think are mostly sophisticated uh, issues thrown in to, 
to muddy up the waters a little bit. Like, for example, what about conditions of national security? You know, can we can we suspend the Constitution? In other words, can we suspend your rights to protect your rights? Which is basically the issue. And oh, you you get into these silly debates and. I think anybody, if they thought it through, said, no, you can't take away my rights to protect my rights. That doesn't make sense at all. But basically, that's what the the uh, philosophy behind the Patriot Act and all these other so-called uh, security acts is all about. They're going to take away your freedom now, so you don't have to worry about losing it later. Declaring martial law has nothing to do with legality. It's just a declaration. Uh, declaring martial law uh, is done when a military commander or a leader of the military, even if he's the president, he's the leader of the military, speaking in this mode, stands up and said, I, the leader, uh, hereby declare that this nation is under military law. And that means all other laws are disbanded. So there's nothing legal about it. There's nothing constitutional about it. It is martial law. It's dictatorship. Original intent of the founders, I think, is pretty self-evident. Original intent is original intent. What did the founding fathers intend when they wrote those words into the Constitution? Uh, they can be interpreted in modern context. You can say, well, uh, they might have intended it to apply to um, um, all money, for example, in the times of the drafting of the Constitution. But in, today, in today's world, it doesn't apply that way. Well, you can say that the Constitution should not be interpreted according to the original intent of the Founding Fathers, but I don't think you'd stand much of a chance of winning a debate on that position. The Constitution means what means what the founders intended it to mean. Otherwise, it means nothing. If, if, you, if you want to have the Constitution mean what modern politicians think it should mean, then you don't need a Constitution. In fact, you're better off without one. Just say, what do the modern politicians want us to do today? Forget the Constitution. If you're messing around with the Constitution, you must face the reality that it means only what the original intent was of the Founding Fathers. The word values is a pretty broad word. When people use the word values in society, I think generally they're talking about the definition of their culture what is the predominant religious view? What is their view of justice? What kind of a judicial system do they have? Do they think that everybody is entitled to, the, to, a, free, uh, to, a, to a fair trial, for example? Uh, do they believe uh, in honesty? Um, every culture has its own little set of rules and regulations, the ethics of that culture. Many of them overlap, but you'd be surprised as you travel around the world, how divergent some of those elements can be. Uh, for example, in, in the United States and in the Western world, the idea of monogamous marriage is just, it's a value. It's, uh, it's a very important value, but there are parts in the world where um, uh, a man is entitled, in fact, an obligation to have more than one wife, especially if there's a woman that needs to be provided for. Her husband has died and she's on the street to take her in as a second wife and so forth. And, and Americans are horrified at that idea because they're all they're tied up with this question of sexuality and they don't realize that in other cultures it's got very little to do with sexuality at all. It has to do with family unit and, and supporting people in need and so forth. So each culture has its, uh, its, its different values. And that's not to say that we're supposed to have the view that all cultures are equal. I think we're entitled to be uh, biased in this sense. I think most of us, in, regardless of what culture we're in, are entitled to think that our culture is the best. And um, I don't think that we ought to be trapped into the position of saying, well, our values are no good because they're different from other people's values. But in Western civilization, certainly in the United States, we have a set of values that has served us well. 
and has, has created a great civilization. And uh, without going into enumerating them, uh, I think that those values are worth protecting. Cultural Marxism is a phrase that's used to describe a way of of spreading the doctrine of Marxist-style collectivism through means other than straight politics and economics. Marx, in his works Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto, spoke very eloquently about the ways of bringing about collectivism through political and economic means. But after Marx, there were a group of Marxists who wisely decided that you could bring this collectivist society to a nation through culture as well, by introducing certain values and concepts that would break down the family, for example. Just one example. If you could somehow break down the family unit so that it was no longer self-sustaining and no longer valued in a society, then that would leave individual members who formerly could turn to the family for support in times of need. They would now be cut loose. They would be without a place to go in times of need. So now they have to turn to the government, you say. So if you can destroy the family, you are creating collectivism. You are supporting and expanding collectivism. If you can, if you can break people away from religious affinities, for example, where they would turn to their, uh, community, their religious community for support and help, or they would turn to scripture for answers to certain perplexing questions, uh, they would have an, if they have an affinity to their religion, they might say, well, we're not going to go along with government because it's contrary to my religion. So cultural Marxism would attack religion of all kinds. doesn't make any difference because that there was another place where people could go other than to the government for support and, and, for, uh, uh, and for answers. So cultural Marxism would be that type of activity in any society that breaks down the culture in such a way so that people instinctively turn to government as an alternative for the support that they otherwise would have. This is done through art, it's through music, it's through literature, it's through motion pictures and that kind of thing. It's the implanting of certain ideas and concepts which make them very ripe for the philosophy of collectivism and makes them very ripe for turning to government as the big daddy, the big solver of all problems. Values come from our family, they come from our society, they come from our religion, they come from the media, they come from all sources. Some claim, and I think there's some support for it, that some of it is inbred, that we, some people have a, of a, more of an instinct for certain values of kindness and justice and so forth than others. That can be debated, but there's certainly no debate that values are absorbed from outside through all of these other channels. Whenever you discuss values, you wind up discussing comparative values, don't you? I mean, this value versus that value. This is better than that value. And inevitably, uh, you find people that hold different values than yours. And all of a sudden, you've got a little debate on your hands, and some people cannot stand a difference of opinion on their values. You know, the, somebody said once that the only thing that uh, uh, people uh, are open-minded about are those things in which they have no strong opinion. And I think there's some truth to that. We tend to be open-minded on a lot of things, except when you hit home, you know, something we really believe in. So that's what happens in the discussion of values. We all believe very strongly on them. And so that's where it's like walking through a field of landmines. Values are taught in public school. They cannot be otherwise. You, there's no institution at all that can avoid teaching values if by no other means than example. 
Uh, you can teach values by just uh, not doing certain things, by avoiding certain topics. Students pick up on that. They, they get the message that, they're, oh, we're not talking about religion, for example. Well, that's a value. We don't talk about religion. That's a value. Um, so institutions, including schools, all teach values. Uh, can they? Yes, they can, and they, sh and they do. Should they? Uh, I think they should. But now the question is, what values? And now we're to a deeper question, which is when we talk about schools, we're talking generally about public schools, which are political entities. Now we're talking about a, a, a school system that's teaching values that's determined not by the, by the parents, not even by the teachers, but by the political uh, groups that provide the funding, the politicians, the bureaucrats, the, the uh, think tanks, all the these invisible uh, structures above. Now, those are the people who are determining the values that are being taught in our schools. I think, personally, the ultimate answer is that schools should teach values. Schools should be completely operated uh, by parents. They should be in control, and therefore the parents can determine what values are taught to the students. If the if the school doesn't teach the values that that parent wants taught to their children, then they can take the child out of that school under my ideal system and put him in another school which does teach those values. I think in any discussion of whether or not a person has the right to use coercion or violence against another person. That can be answered by reducing it to a very simple illustration of just the two people involved. The question is, would I have a right to use violence against someone who was trying to force me to um, participate in something that's immoral or to acknowledge something which I consider to be immoral, or to go along with an activity that I consider to be immoral? Do I have a right to use violence against a person who's doing that? And I would say, if they're using coercion against me, then yes, I, I'm, then I have a right to defend myself. If they're just using the power of persuasion, if they're just lecturing me to do such and such, I don't have the right to use force against them, no. The question of indoctrinating soldiers to participate in a war and be willing to kill uh, enemy soldiers, uh, is that a morality, is that a moral thing to do or not, is, is very complex because there are several assumptions that are made in that. First of all, the assumption is that the war is a just war. If the war is a just war, and we could define that. There's another assumption. What makes an, a just war? And we'll perhaps come back to that. But putting that aside for the moment, if we assume that the war is just, which in my view is that it's defensive, um, then I don't think you need to indoctrinate any soldiers to be willing to go into battle and fight and kill if necessary, because they're not just going out to kill somebody because they want to kill somebody. They're, they're fighting to defend their homeland. They're fighting to, to defend their families, their wives, their children. And that is an intrinsic right. In fact, that's an obligation, I think, that we all have. I don't think we need to indoctrinate anybody to do that. Now, if we have to indoctrinate soldiers to do that, and by that, we're going to assume that means we have to convince them to do something that they wouldn't logically do if they had uh, full knowledge of all the facts, uh, well then it's not a just war in my view. I think that a just war is one that you don't need to indoctrinate anybody to go fight it. If it's a just war, people will know that it, it, needs, uh, it needs them in it. So there are a couple of words there that make it tough. Is it, is it a just war? And secondly, if, if it is a just war, indoctrination will not be necessary. two questions in there. I think that um, 
values are very much determined by the luck of where you were born. I think that if any of us had been born in the middle of Africa, for example, our values would be entirely different than what we have today. Uh, if we were born in the middle of uh, Asia, our values would be different than what we have here in the United States. There's no question in my mind that values are partly the luck of where we're born, the luck of who our parents are, uh, the luck of the community in which we live, certainly the luck of our friends. I think as young people we tend to want to, uh, we want to be accepted. We're very vulnerable at, a, vulnerable at a certain age. We want to be accepted and there's tremendous peer pressure to be one of the, the guys, you know, at a certain early age. And I think if we're unlucky, we run into some bad people and we want to be like them. If we're real lucky, uh, we run into good people. But on top of that, I think the influence of our home is perhaps the most, the most uh, powerful of all. Because uh, I think if you have good values in your home, that an individual can certainly resist and reject bad values from acquaintances in, in school and maybe even in the media. But anyway, all those, all those uh, factors are uh, at work. And, um, and so when you have two soldiers meeting on the battlefield, they all come from a different background of values. And I'm sure, it's sad, but I'm sure it's true that when you have two nations fighting each other, the soldiers on both sides believe firmly that they are on the right side. They, they have to. They believe that they are fighting for their country and their homeland, their culture, uh, their way of life. And, and they believe that the other side is evil and trying to take away what they have. And so blood is spilled. And it's largely a result of, of opposing values. Is it logical? Yes and no. It's certainly logical that it happens that way when you realize that values are different in different parts of the world and soldiers come from different parts of the world and they bring the values with them that they inherited. So it's logical that it should happen that way, but is it logical that it sh must always be that way in the future? I don't think so. I think the time is coming with the uh, ability to communicate around the world, to share ideas. I, I think the time is coming, hopefully in the not-too-distant future, when this whole business of war will, will be seen as an illogical event, and that the people themselves who see it as an illogical event um, will be able to take control of their governments and prevent their governments from thrusting them into a war that they don't want. So it's logical and illogical at the same time, like so many things, but we are, I think we're moving into the light, and I hope someday the logic of, of peace will be much stronger than the logic of war. The phrase culture war generally applies to a clash of civilizations, I think is the way they put it now, a clash of cultures where peoples with different uh, cultural backgrounds uh, suddenly find it uh, that their cultures are mutually incompatible. I really find that hard to believe because cultures have been able to get along side by side for thousands of years until political leaders come along and decide that they want the territory or the riches of the other country and then they start playing upon the cultural differences of their people to whip up some kinds of, of a hatred against the other culture. I don't think that cultures in, inherently are uh, antagonistic to each other. I think they're, they're rich. I mean, I've traveled in many parts of the world and have seen some amazingly different cultures. Uh, I'm just fascinated by them. I don't see just because they're different than mine. I don't feel any urge to go out and start killing everybody I see. And I don't think that others are the same way from those cultures when they come to the United States or to other Western countries. They don't have this insane desire to start killing everybody because they have a different culture. I think it's a, it's a rich fabric and people can, can observe and appreciate each other's culture without having hatred of the other culture. The hatred part comes when the political leaders are trying to whip up the populations into a, an emotional support for a war that has entirely other foundations for it. A war for economic gain, a, a war for 
imperialism, a war for domination, a war for oil, a war for money, whatever it is, that they can't tell the people that that's the reason for the war, so they tell them it's because the other culture is so bad, and the other culture hates you, and if you don't hate them before they hate you, it's going to be too bad, and so forth. It's all the politicians that create this kind of a scene. So culture differences, in my view, are are not uh, not a bad thing at all. I think they're I think they're very fascinating. In fact, I think there's a richness to it that makes the world a better place. Uh, I don't see them as the cause for war. The United States used to be a melting pot, a place where all peoples from different cultures could come and they all knew that they had a new homeland and they would not necessarily uh, give up their old traditions or their old affinities but they took on a new one and they knew that now here in America we must become Americans we must adopt the American way we must adopt the American language and it was a melting pot it was a very healthy thing gradually that has changed now we're being taught to celebrate diversity. Uh, every culture, every race, every religion now is being in, uh, being in, uh, sort of pushed into the direction of placing their heritage above the American melting pot. They're being told that the American melting pot is a bad thing, that you should, uh, you should uh, have allegiance to your homeland and to your origins first. So now it's no longer a melting pot. Now it's kind of like a centrifugal force uh, where people are being thrown away from the center and we're having more and more divisions based on, on culture than we ever have before. It's a very bad sign, and uh, I think we have to go back to the melting pot concept again. I think the answer to finding the real cause of war can be found by examining the nations throughout history that have waged wars, the ones who have launched wars, the ones who have initiated wars. If you take a look at them, in every case they have been powerful nations. They have been nations which have been rich, had a lot of commerce, had industry, uh, they were politically influential, they were well fed, they had everything, and they wanted more. There's a myth today that wars are caused by poverty, caused by ignorance, and caused by all these things. Not so, because the nations that have waged wars have been the richest nations in the world, and there's been very little poverty within them, and they've been the best educated nations of the world. So right away we can throw out those usual myths about poverty and ignorance being the cause of war. The cause of war is power. Nations that wage wars have too much power and they want more. That in a nutshell is the cause of war. Well, in my book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, I created a fanciful uh, scenario called the Rothschild Formula. And it was um, an explanation of why the international bankers participate in uh, financing both sides of wars. Now, I made it very clear that I doubt that this was ever spelled out, certainly never written by Rothschild or any of the other bankers, but the ones in that banking fraternity understand the rules of the game pretty well nevertheless. And it, it goes something like this, that the, the very wise and wealthy financiers of the world, going way back, even before Rothschild's time, have observed that the world was a pretty rotten place to live in. Uh, that nations were always fighting over something or other. There always somebody was always trying to conquer somebody else, and wars were universal. Too bad about that, but that's the way it is. So uh, they decided that well, since you can't stop wars, you might as well benefit from them. You might as well finance the uh, these warring sides because they pay 
They pay a lot of money to get uh, gold and silver, whatever they need to, to finance their military excursions. They need money. So we found out that we bankers, that if we loan money to them, that um, we get paid back. They don't question what the interest rate is because they're fighting a war. And if they can win the war, they can just plunder the victim and pay us whatever we want out of the plunder. It doesn't cost them anything, really. So too bad about that. But we'll finance both sides of any war because we're not going to stop it. We might as well benefit from it. Then the issue comes up of what happens if one of these nations uh, decides not to pay us. What are we going to do about it? Well, that's a problem. Uh, since we bankers, uh, we don't have any military of our own, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to force that nation that we loaned this money to to pay us back? Ah, the answer is very simple. If they refuse to pay us back, we'll finance an opposing nation or a revolutionary group somewhere else to become an enemy of that nation and attack it and destroy it, invade it. We'll create another war, in other words, in order to get our money back. We'll finance this side to attack that side. And so by financing all sides in a war and keeping the world divided up into warring factions so that no one unit is particularly stronger than the other, the banks can continue to finance all sides of wars forever and always collect their interest because they have the ability of, put one nation, of putting one nation against another nation against another nation to collect their debts. In a nutshell, that's the, the Rothschild formula. War is tolerated. In fact, war is even applauded in many cases because people are of the impression that it is to the benefit of their nation. People tolerate or applaud war if they think it's a defensive war if they think that they're defending themselves against a dreaded enemy, you would certainly tolerate a war, you would applaud it. So that's the answer. The, the object is to convince the people of all nations, including those that are doing the attacking, to convince the population that their war is really a war of defense. They have to create in the minds of their people, an image of a, of a terrible enemy out there. And the reason they're attacking the enemy is because if they don't, he's going to attack them first. So it's a question of who's, who gets the first shot. So the people have been propagandized in many cases to always believe that the other side is the enemy. Now that's not to say that there aren't enemies out there. That's not to say that in the United States, for example, we never fought a, a, a just war. I mean, that's not the issue. The issue is that, in general, wars are always tolerated and applauded because the people believe in their hearts that it is a justified war, which means it's a defensive war against a dreaded enemy. The issue of murder versus killing as it relates to war is pretty much the same as it relates to individuals. If an individual kills another person in self-defense, if he's defending his life and has to shoot somebody who's threatening his life, that's not murder. It's self-defense. It's killing, but it's not murder. If a nation is engaged in a just war, which means a defensive war, and the killing goes on, that's not mass murder. That's killing. It's true. It's killing, but it's defensive. So the question is whether or not the war is aggressive or defensive. If an individual takes the initiative against another individual and takes their life, that's murder. If a nation is aggressive against another nation and kills hundreds of thousands, of, uh, kills hundreds of thousands of people in the in the assault, that could be called murder also because it's aggressive and not defensive. So there's no di there's no difference between mass murder and killing in an aggressive war. Capital punishment is an issue which has a tremendous amount of energy and emotion attached to it because some people look at it as, as the needless taking of another person's life and they have strong uh, religious convictions against that or perhaps just ethical convictions against it. Others see um, 
you know, execution of a criminal. They see that as uh, not only not only retaliation or or justice, but they see it as part of a mechanism that will prevent future crimes from being committed. In other words, they believe that if you don't punish a murderer for his crime, that that will result in more murders taking place in the future. So it is a, a, in their minds, it's a it's a justified. Uh, process because it actually saves lives. It's not just seeking revenge or seeking justice for the commission of one crime, but it's saving the lives of future victims who, because of this, will not be attacked. And all of that has to be viewed again in the context of whether it is aggressive or defensive. If you are taking the life of a criminal who has been duly processed and convicted of a crime, and you're taking his life. That's not an aggressive act. It's a defensive act. You are defending the lives of future victims by um, making a, a statement to society that future criminals, future killers, are not going to get away with it, and that will save lives in the future. And therefore, in that sense, it is a defensive act. In an age when we're all fed up with war, it's very easy to be so anti-war that we don't think anymore about the question of a just war. We think that all wars are wrong. In my view, this is, a, is not clear thinking. Defensive wars are justified. And in a defensive war, if somebody's trying to attack us and take over our country, truly, truly do, not something that our political leaders have created this myth about, but really is truly happening, then we would gain by winning that war. Because if we didn't win it, we would lose our freedom. So there would be a net gain in a true defensive war. We've got to get rid of this thinking that all wars are automatically unjust. I have to say that most wars in our modern age, in my view, are unjust because they're, they're being fought over reasons which are not honestly stated. They're being fought over hidden agendas. But we must keep in mind that there is a theoretical basis for a just defensive war. And in that case, the winner would have a tremendous amount to gain be preserving his liberty. Wars at the scale that we know them in the modern world would simply not be possible and they would not happen if it weren't possible for the nations who are waging those wars to raise the money from their population through the hidden tax called inflation. There are, I can't think of any modern wars that would have been fought if the taxpayers of those countries had been known right if they had known right up front what it was actually going to cost them they would have they would have demanded some kind of a compromise or something but since they don't know what it's costing they don't know that it's costing them 50 60 70 80 percent of their 90 percent in their lifetime of everything they've earned they don't know that uh, but if they did know that they wouldn't permit it they wouldn't allow their politicians to to do it the only way the governments can do that is to get the money from the people in a fashion that they don't know they're paying it. And that is through inflation. Inflation is caused by the Federal Reserve System through fiat money, the creation of money out of nothing. So the relationship between fiat money and wars is direct and immediate. If it were not for fiat money, most of the wars that we've known in recent times simply would not have been fought on either side. Eisenhower was dead right about the military-industrial complex. What more can you say than that? Just look around you and there you see it everywhere. Now, it's interesting to me that even though Eisenhower was right about that, uh, he came from it and was very close to it most of his life. And I, I don't know for sure whether uh, 
he was uh, doing what so often we see politicians do, is they speak against something while at the same time supporting it. Uh, I'm not prepared to go that far, but I do know that that has happened many, many times. I think of the establishment of the Federal Reserve System. Um, when Woodrow Wilson came out and spoke so vehemently against it, and yet he signed the bill and he was, he was financed by the, the banks and so his job was to speak against it so that people would think that he was the voice of caution and that he wouldn't allow anything to happen that wasn't in the best interest of the American people. Whereas all the way along, he, it was known from the beginning that he was going to cooperate and let it go through. So whether Eisenhower is in that boat or not, I don't know. But uh, the simple answer is that he was right about the military industrial complex. Definitely right. The way that the United States was set up originally was that the defense of the nation was to be primarily the responsibility of the states. They were to create militia drawn upon able-bodied American citizens within the state. They were to provide their weapons and their training and their leaders. They were to form into a, into a national fighting force and they would defend the borders of the United States against uh, foreign enemies. But the primary foundation, the element of that, was the militia. And that wasn't just because it was a primitive society. It wasn't just because they hadn't thought about having a national standing army. As a matter of fact, the Founding Fathers had written, had discussed it, and then they'd written about how much they feared a standing army. They thought that a standing army was perhaps a, one of the most dangerous things you could imagine, because if, if Washington, D.C., they said if they were to have a standing army, you know what they're going to do with it? They're going to use it. You're going to use it for something. If you get a bunch of soldiers sitting around training, you're going to use them. And they didn't want that, except in a defensive uh, mode. So they did not want a standing national army. It was to be national uh, military and police forces entirely. And, and I think uh, they had another reason for it, which is because they knew that uh, an armed uh, populace was the best defense against tyranny, either abroad or at home. These guys that created the American Constitution, the American Republic, were looking into the future and they were concerned about our own government becoming uh, despotic. They could see that. They talked about the possibility of that. How do we prevent that from happening was a major issue of discussion. And they said one of the ways is to make sure that we don't give them a standing army. And the other way is to make sure that the local population was armed. <laughs> because if you've got every man, uh, able-bodied man in the country, and women too, armed and knowing how to use a weapon, and under training, and with their local uh, uh, squad leaders and so forth, their own commanders, uh, there's no government that's in the United States that's going to turn against them. So they were very wise, I thought. And today, and people laugh at that concept, but uh, now that we're losing our liberties, I, I think the laughter is dying down pretty rapidly. To answer the question very succinctly, the Constitution foresaw that the best defense of the United States from enemies both foreign and domestic was to have a fully armed and trained local militia, and they did not want a standing federal army. In the final analysis, if this country is to be defended, it must be defended by we the people. It must be defended by the citizens of this nation. Now, it's true that those citizens can join the military and say, well, now uh, I'm still a citizen. Indeed, there's some debate over that as to when they are, if they still are citizens when they, when they take um, military commission and so forth. But let's say that they are. Um, it's still up to the people to, to defend the nation. And if you look only to the government to do that, you find that today, for example, they're talking about bringing soldiers in from other countries. They're bringing in recruits from Africa and Asia, from Canada, from Mexico, putting them into the federal United States Army because they're not getting enough volunteers from the United States to fill those ranks. Well, now when you have a military, a standing military, that is made up not only of American citizens, but a large contingent of citizens from other countries, you don't 
have something anymore which is focused only on defending your own country. You've got a machine. You've got a military machine which is uh, is ready to go uh, to the highest bidder, to, to the strongest politician, anywhere in the world. Just give us a call. We're ready to go. What do you want? Do you want us to take the, this country? Do you want those oil fields? Do you want that banana plantation? What is it? We're ready to go. Uh, we've got a PR department that will figure out how to explain it and sell it to the people, make it sound like we're fighting for freedom. That's what you're developing under these conditions, and it's very dangerous. The government should not provide for either the individual or the collective. That is not the role of government to provide, at least in in the view of people who follow individualism, in my view. The proper function of government is not to provide, but to protect. Because if you're going to provide for some, you must have the authority and the power to take from others. And once you're in that business of taking from some and giving to others, now you're in the business of redividing the wealth. And that gives you tremendous power over, over the citizenry. And it always leads to abuse of power and eventually to totalitarian regimes. So the proper function of government is not to provide for anybody, it's simply to protect them. I don't believe that the Constitution addresses the issue of corporations. That aside, should corporations have the rights of individuals or people? Uh, I believe that that's an issue that can be good or bad, yes or no, depending on another issue which is seldom discussed. The other issue is if corporations have the rights of individuals, then are the people who run those corporations personally responsible for the actions of the corporation? Now there is the issue that very seldom is discussed. If the president of a corporation, if the board of directors of a corporation, if the chief executives, the vice president, so forth, of corporations, were to all sanction an act, which was to uh, take away the life of an individual, for example, they said, "Well, we're going to do this. Because we don't care about the risk. We're going to we're going to market. Let, let's get specific. We're going to market a drug uh, because we want to make profits." And we know that our laboratory has found uh, test results that make this a very dangerous drug, and we could kill some people with this. But we're going to bury that fact. We're not going to let the public know that we have this, have this data. We're just going to say we've tested it for safety and efficacy, and everything looks good. And now they put the drug on the market, and 350 people die in the first month. Now, the way systems are built today the families of those victims could go to the court and they possibly could get a very big judgment against the corporation. So who pays that bill? Let's say they get a fifty million dollar judgment against the corporation. Who pays the bill? The stockholders of the corporation. They had nothing to do with it. Why not try the president and the executives and the board of directors for murder? Now we've got responsibility here. The same thing applies, by the way, at the government level. If the, uh, if the sheriff uh, of, uh, of the local county authorizes a, an illegal search and seizure of some property and plants some, some dope in somebody's car just so they can get even uh, with a neighbor who he hates, and he, he frames them, and that person goes to jail, and then, and then it's discovered later... Um, Maybe that's not a good example, but in general, any time there is a, a malfeasance of office committed by a sheriff, and I use that example, the victim sues the sheriff's department or, or the city or the county, and sure enough, the taxpayer pays the settlement, not the sheriff, you see. We have this concept of immunity on the part of 
people who hold positions in government and in corporations, which I think is the problem. If that question of immunity was removed so that the leaders in governmental units and corporations were personally held responsible for the effects of their actions, I don't think people would be concerned at all anymore today about those big, bad corporations, because they'd suddenly start becoming pretty good corporations. The, because the, you know, the leaders of the corporations would be on the line for their own personal decisions. I don't think that the problem to, uh, the problem of political corruption is to be solved by limiting the length of time that a politician stays in office. I think the problem, uh, it has more to do with the enlightenment of the electorate. So they don't elect into office people who are corrupt or corruptible. Actually, we have elections every two and every four years. So all of the limits for our elected representatives are automatically set. I mean, every one of them, ha their term ends and they have to be returned to the voters for approval. So that is, I think, where the action should be. Um, if you get rid of one bad politician, it's pretty likely, if you're not asking the right questions, it's pretty likely that you'll just get another bad politician to replace him. As a matter of fact, the shorter the term, the more likely they are to try and make the killing as fast as they can before they get booted out of office. I think looking at the term limits is, is not looking at the right place. The right place to look for a solution to the problem of corrupt politicians is at the voter and their perception of who they're voting for and what the political principles of their candidates are. Now, part of that's due to the media, which, of course, will never allow those issues to be discussed. It's a big issue, I understand, but I don't think this limiting politicians' term is going to change a darn thing, except create the illusion that perhaps uh, a, a solution has been provided which when it hasn't. If everyone were voted out of Congress and new people voted in, uh, we'd lose an awful lot of bad politicians and one or two good ones. And I think since the same people would be voting in the new politicians that voted in the old politicians, we'd probably have an awful lot of new bad politicians go back into office and one or two good ones. So in other words, I don't think there'd be any change. There's no doubt in my mind that the political apparatus of the United States government is much more beholden to the powerful lobbying interests, the companies that can write those big fat checks, campaign contributions and that sort of thing. Uh, you can see it every day. The politicians will give speeches, very good speeches in some cases, saying all the things that the voters want to hear. But then when it comes time to vote on an issue, they quite often will go directly opposite to what they said, and they will vote in favor of the positions that the corporations want and the lobbyists want. Uh, while, uh, while the average voter will write letters to his congressman, many of the corporations are writing checks to their congressman, and you can be sure which one gets the most attention. The Federal Reserve is technically owned by the member banks, so we know who owns the Federal Reserve, the member banks. But who owns the member banks is uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to find out, because the member banks uh, are not registered with any government agency. They're not uh, corporations. Uh, I understand, I haven't checked into all of them, but I understand that they have the, uh, the uh, basic structure of a partnership or something very private. It may even be something unique. I don't know. I've never looked into that part of it. But it's not on the public record. And the owners or the partners uh, of these banks are not about to uh, let it be known. Now, it's true that you can buy stock 
uh, in, you know, Chase Manhattan and all that sort of thing. You can buy stock in the Bank of America and, you know, as a stockholder you're listed. But the true control and ownership of these, uh, corporations is, uh, is, is not on the public record. And uh, it's, it's easy to hide that. You can use street names. You can use Swiss accounts. You can have corporations holding stock for other corporations which are holding stock for other corporations and that sort of thing. And, um, in general, it's it's possible to completely conceal the controlling interest from of the banks from the public. But now, having said that, I want to go one step further and say that it's perhaps not as important as you might think whether the exact names are known for these banks, because whether they're known or not, we still have the same problem. Yes, it's a matter of curiosity to know whether or not the banks have any foreign interest, whether the Rothschilds own a big block of it or, or that sort of thing. That would be very interesting. Um, and in fact, it might even be a legal issue because the Federal Reserve, being a, um, a corporation created by the federal government and charged with uh, 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 representing the United States government in terms of monetary affairs, there may be some limitations of foreign stockholders. I don't know about that. But so there may be some legal pre question there. But the point I'm trying to lead to is that regardless of who owns these banks, the issue still remains the same. If the banks were all uh, held um, publicly, the issues would still be the same. Who runs the banks? Who controls them from behind the scenes? You can control a corporation or a bank, uh, even if it's not a corporation, without actually having 51% ownership of the shares of stock. As a matter of fact, most corporations are controlled with about two, three percent of the, of the stock, and in some cases much less than that. And uh, so the issue is who controls these banks and what do they do with them? If we were to abolish the Federal Reserve System tomorrow and get the banks out of it completely, turn the entire function as it now operates over to the Treasury, so now there are no banks involved in terms of ownership at least, the, the banks are still involved, but they don't own the Federal Reserve. Now the Treasury is operating this whole mechanism. Nothing would change. The same people would still dominate the system from behind the scenes. So this question of ownership, I think, receives too much attention because the idea, where that idea goes is that, well, if we can just find out who owns these banks, and if we don't like who they are, then we can uh, support a move to abolish the Federal Reserve banks and turn that system over to the Treasury, exactly as it's now operating, you see. <laughs> so the focus should not be on who owns the banks, but on what the banks are doing, you see. And that's why I... I, I back a little bit away from the traditional answer to that question. The New Deal, like the Great Society and, and like the Universal uh, Peace proposals advanced by uh, President Wilson, all of these presidential programs uh, that have expanded the power of government have been the implementation of collectivism in America. Starting at the, about the time of Woodrow Wilson, the country at that point was pretty much uh, an individualistic uh, country. It was based on the principle of, of the individual being supreme and the government being the servant uh, of the people. Starting with World War I, starting with Woodrow Wilson, on down through World War II, down through the Vietnam War, now to the War on Terrorism, all these wars are always used to frighten the American people into accepting the expansion of government, supposedly to protect us against an evil, terrible enemy. It has not been good for America. It has been the demise of America. It has been sold to Americans as being a good thing because it somehow benefited them. But when you look at where we were then and where we are now, you can see that we have traveled the road to totalitarianism almost, almost to the very end. <laughs> I like that question, uh, should the government be taxing illegal activities because of the fact that it might in 
make them want the illegal activities to be prosperous. Uh, my answer, perhaps, is a little extreme. I think most of what the government is doing is an illegal activity. And I see no difference between most of what the government is doing and these so-called illegal businesses it's taxing. And uh, that may sound a little extreme, but when you hold the view that government should be doing only those things to protect the lives, liberty, and property of its citizens, nothing more, and that everything else it's doing is not in the best interest of the American people. In fact, it is, it is the same as uh, theft. It's the same as stealing their property from them, their hard-earned wages. It's, it's the same as taking away their freedom. It, it's everything is that the government is doing to the people when it deviates the basic purpose of the Constitution is the same as a criminal syndicate would do as an illegal business would do. So why are we all upset about taxing an illegal business when the authority that's doing the taxing is itself an illegal business? So that's my extreme answer. The government has no incentive to reduce uh, the consumption of uh, nicotine or alcohol, um, nor should it. That's not the proper function of government. Whether or not it has a revenue stream from these activities is very secondary to the primary question is uh, whether it should have any interest in these activities at all. Now, if it could be shown that the consumption of alcohol uh, or nicotine or drugs or some such does endanger the life, liberty, or property of its citizens, and I think some argument could be made for that, then to the extent to which that can be shown, then that is the extent, and only to that extent, that the government should have any interest at all in regulating or taxing these activities. <laughs> The government should have no interest in funding or regulating or, or directing the activities of alternative energy companies or technologies, except to the extent that that might be viewed as a means of protecting the life, liberty, or property of its citizens. If you can legitimately, and without stretching your brain all over the place, to say, well, if this, 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 and this, but if it's a direct relationship, then the government should have an interest in it. Probably doesn't have any relationship at all. So it shouldn't be involved in these issues. How can you prevent the big players from co-opting these fields? Why should we prevent the big, the big players from co-opting these. What business is it of ours to co-opt anybody, big players or little players? Why are we suddenly uh, supposed to be so wise and so powerful that we can decide who should be in these fields? See, that's the mentality. Just asking that question of who should decide assumes that there is a decider, if I may use that phrase. We should not be in the business of deciding. We should let the free market make its own choices. Only then, only then, when you get this, this word we out of our mind, what are we going to do about it? Only then will we have true solutions. <laughs>